Welcome to Beat the Market. I'm Richter. And I'm BKM. So, David Swenson is today's topic, and I think uh, this is actually one of the great case studies to, for us to do in these kind of videos, um, you know, for th three reasons. Uh, one is he's one of those rare people, I think, in this world that really understand alpha. He, he understands what the academics are saying about the efficient market and understands at the same time where the limitations are. And I don't think there's a lot of people in the world that really understand in such a nuanced way because the traders think clearly the efficient market hypothesizers have no idea what they're talking about. And the academics think that the traders just got lucky. And I think Swenson straddles those two worlds um, and really understands, I think really understands how to really get at alpha. Uh, the other thing I think that really makes him unique and worthy of study is his advice is practical uh, in the sense that, you know, to contrast it with Buffett, Buffett's main advice is uh, to the non-practitioner or to the layman is just dollar cost average or, or uh, systematically buy the S&P 500, which is good advice, but it's a little impractical in, 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 re in the real world for one, psychologically, and then two, that approach is really just about increasing your net worth, which isn't rational in, the, in, a, in a real setting. It's, it's really the money's supposed to supplement and enhance your life. And I think Swenson's advice is a little bit more, it's less, because it's less volatile, it's more practical. And the third thing is the earlier videos when we talk about trading and when we, or, or guys like Buffett, that's like a full-time job, whereas Swenson's large advice can be done, is a little bit more accessible. Um, not, to, not to diminish his contributions or his achievements in any way, at, just, at a high level it's, just, it's, more, it's more usable for more people. I think it just takes time to under, understand and appreciate how good he really is, because the young temptation is to just shoot the lights out. Sure, sure. I mean, Swenson's one of the pioneers in asset allocation. Um, he took over Yale's endowment in the um, was 1986 or something like that, mid late 80s, um, and he's compounded at 13 and a half percent nominal since then, which is uh, the best record of any major endowment. Um, it's you know it's a few percent lower than guys like Buffett and Soros, but um, for the amount of money that he started with and the level of volatility that he's had, it's, a, it's an excellent return. And he's taken very little risk from that, or very little risk to get that return. And he's done so, he's done so in an unconventional manner. Um, you know, most of these um, managers with high long-term numbers like that are either um, traders using leverage like Soros or um, you know, trend followers or um, exclusively uh, equity guys like Buffett who uses leverage of a, of a, of a different kind anyway. But um, I believe Yale's worst uh, drawdown was in the crisis of 08. It wasn't that bad. It was on, it was on the order of 30%, right, compared to 55% for, uh, for the S&P. But he's outperformed the S&P by you know, a good 4% on average for the last 30 years. So actually, I don't know all that much about his personal advice, his advice to um, regular investors. Um, you, you actually knew him. You, you took his class. Yeah, I, I wouldn't say I knew him. I was one of, <laughs> I was one of many, many students in Portfolio Management 101. And uh, I didn't quite appreciate all the knowledge then as I do now. Um, you know, the first day of class, they, 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 or he, he talks about diversification. And this is something we talked about early in the videos. I didn't quite appreciate diversification because I had a little bit of the academic approach to making money in the sense that, that uh, not a, meaning I was just trying to get rich and I didn't really think through, the, think through it. Whereas 
and a lot of people just took diversification for granted. And that was like the first day of class, like, oh, yeah, of course you want to diversify. You know, it's like, the, it was like, a, there was like a, some thought study. It was like, okay, you can have, you, you have two periods to invest and you can either be an umbrella salesman or a sunglasses salesman or be, um, or, or be both, or you, know, or, or, you know, sell one, one year, or like each, no, each, each period you, ha you can sell um, two, 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 the sunglasses or the umbrella, the sunglasses and the umbrella, and clearly selling the sunglasses and the umbrella was the best choice because, uh, you're, you know, if it, if it rains, you have a product, and if, it, if it, uh, sun the sun's out, you have a product. But in my, in my mind, I was like, well, you know, if it rains and you have two umbrellas, you're gonna make twice as much money. <laughs> you know, or, or if the sun's out, you can, ha you, can uh, you, you can make twice as much money. And I didn't quite appreciate that um, there's a value for, for uh, s not having that, that, up, that, uh, that two times the payoff, but the, and the cost is zero. I was like, oh, well, that's okay. I mean, I went for, I went for the, I went for 2x and I got zero, that's, that's all right. And it worked out for you as a young guy. I mean, if you'd taken his advice, if you listened to what all your professors had told you, you'd never have gone into prop trading and you know, had all that success early in life. <laughs> right, right, right. But as you get old, you know, but as you get older, um, well, as you get older and, and, and if you have to steward real capital as Swenson yeah. did, you can't, and, and in anybody's in personal life, if you have to steward your own retirement, you yeah, really if you, can't. If you would just, if you would just, when you when you quit Daytech, if you would just invest to like Swenson from day one, you would have been better off. You could have written ten books in the meantime and saved yourself all that losing half your money the the last three times. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, exactly. Yeah, right, exactly. So the the key is go for broke when you're young, and if you if you if you overcome it, over, you know, overcome the odds, then, then become the, the prudent, the prudent when you get investor. A, when you get a big score, get, uh, get conservative, you know, do, do uh, you know, don't take those big risks anymore. Lock in at least, uh, at least a portion of it. But um, yeah, it just, it, it occurs to me that Swenson was forced to look at things um, from that perspective because it wasn't just the, the size of the capital that he was managing. I mean, a guy like Soros had a whole lot of money, but he could still do whatever he wanted. He could be quite nimble. Um, he could, you know, come up with a, a one-off thesis, like the REIT market is gonna be strong for this or that reason. It starts to move, he takes a position, pyramid it, and then, you know, abandon it like that. So Soros is, uh, you know, remained a hands-on trader at size, but, um, an institution is so much slower, um, and, and its purpose is different. Soros's purpose was to get rich. Yeah, where where uh, Swenson's uh, purpose is to use the end Yale endowment to support the university's mission. Exactly. He needs he needs to churn off. He needs to be generating a certain IRR to well support the budget because the uh, yeah the university came actually to rely on the endowment to a, a, a very large extent. I mean, currently, two-thirds of um, Yale College's operating budget comes from the endowment. Now, my comment to that on a side note is, where, where does the money go? I know. I, know. <laughs> I, think, I, I think it's just overhead. I think it's, sure, they, they splurge on all kinds of stuff. I mean, the, the uh, meal plan is pretty good these days, the housing and the libraries and new buildings, always new buildings. Why? And always in this ugly modern style, guys. <laughs> I mean, look at, look at what the college used to, used to have. But, um, and administrators, like, I think if you, if, you, if you look at education anywhere, even the public school system, you have many more administrators per pupil than you did 50 years ago. So I think there's a whole lot of, there's a whole lot of, uh, waste in the system that didn't used to be there. So this gets a little bit off the topic, but I think worthy of discussion in a general sense. Um, you know, one of the things that I found remarkable and interesting about Swenson is, I, is that he's, you know, I call him irrationally rational. Um, what, one part is the background knowledge I knew was when he came, you know, he, was, he, he, he came to Yale from Solomon Brothers, so he could have had a very lucrative Wall that. Street. Yeah, he did not fit in at Solomon Brothers, I'm sure. He's <laughs> like such a soft-spoken, upper Midwest personality. Yeah, I mean, he comes across as a real gentleman in that, <clears throat> the, you know, the video that we decided the, uh, 
spawned us to discuss, you know, start discussing him. He's a nice guy. <laughs> like, you, you trust him. You like you. He's such a. He takes those salaries. It's still just a million dollars a year. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, but something that he, when he left when he left uh, Sombras and something around that, he just took a million dollars a year salary, which you know in the eighties was it's a lot of money. It's a lot of money for most people, but compared to what he could have made in Wall Street, or compared to what he could have made mm -hmm. um, being a portfolio manager. He's, it's, it's it's not much. It's not much at all. It ha he hasn't asked for more. Like yeah. maybe maybe it's bumped up, but I don't think so. I think I read it a couple of years ago. It was still like a million bucks. So it's, I mean, it's a tremendous gift to the Yale. The guys at Harvard, on the other hand, were were getting paid a lot. They wanted to get paid a lot. I forget the guy's name. Jack something. Schwartz. And then he eventually got. But um, yeah, he, they they were getting paid a lot. The um, the uh, trustees felt that they were overpaid, these guys. <laughs> and so they quit and started an independent management firm that the college had to hire, and then ended up getting paid at least the same amount. <laughs> right, right. I mean, I mean the, 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 the contrary argument is that, right, you need to pay for the talent um, at, this, uh, at the same time, you know, who's to know? You don't anymore. You can just copy Swenson. He tells you how to do it. But, but for Yale, he, he's just been a tremendous blessing, right? To, both to have somebody who's willing to be under market yeah. and also to give that stability to that university in, in yeah. this, I mean, and, you know, in defense of the, not real, true defense of the Harvard people, but in their defense, they're, they're doing what's the more natural thing, which is to maximize their dollars, whereas, whereas uh, Swenson is, is, I mean, it's irrationally rational because in his mind, you probably didn't need much more than a million dollars. He could live really well and comfortably, and that's very rational, but it's very irrational to, to, to make that choice. He said he looks for, so um, one of the big differences between you know, an institutional investor and um, a typical hedge fund or a private investor is that they tend to farm out a lot of the management. So, uh, do you know what fraction of Yale's endowment is is um, you know managed by third parties given to hedge funds or? Oh, it's more than the majority. Yeah. It, I mean, I don't know if that's partly market driven. I know their U.S. equity exposure is down to like ten percent. And oh, so this is you know one thing that is worthy of giving out of giving away of background. So one of the things that Swenson did that uh, was uh, is that's really um, insightful and w worthy of noting and discussing is that he delineated where the alpha is. So the bond, in bonds, it's very difficult to get alpha. Okay. In terms of the, the, the top quartile and the bottom quartile, it makes a difference of, it's like less than a half a percent. So his point was that there's he no- be a bond trader, but as a bond investor, not so much. Right, and, and because he comes out of a, he appreciates the academic uh, studies that you truly can't beat the market through what we call, you know, what we call swing trading. He doesn't really appreciate tra trading, and maybe it's not possible in, in, in that size. I think but it's just I think it's just easier for him to assemble a portfolio if it's um, if it's not based on trading. Well, one of the things you, so so this gets into one of the things he discussed, right? One of the things about allocating to trader that, and he didn't talk about it in this sense in the setting. He talked about it in quant investing, mm -hmm. but one of the things that makes it difficult to talk uh, to invest in a trader is that. Um, how do you manage the risk and how do you know when they're just gone cold or what or their system is broken that's right if if the if it's you have a bad stretch um you don't know if you should be allocating more or pulling out if the system is you know if it's going to continue to work um the ideal time to invest is when a system is underperforming has been underperforming for the last couple of years um and a lot of a lot of um, you know great quant systems, not just not just uh, momentum, not just you know technical systems, but um, even value systems, um, you know stock picking systems, will um, will have these periods of underperformance, but th those periods are what sustain the alpha. It's like you. You don't get it for free. That outperformance comes at a price, and that price is very often um, the 
awkwardness, the frustration of underperforming a benchmark for um, even it's, it's some, sometimes it's more volatility. Sometimes the price of outperformance is that when the s and is down 50%, you're down 60, so you get paid for that in theory. Um, but sometimes the price is that when the S&P is up 30%, you're only up 15, or you're flat. Like Buffett was flat in, for a couple of years in the dot-com boom. People said, oh, he's lost his touch. All of, all of value was doing poorly back then. Um, but that's exactly why value ends up, ended up outperforming over that, you know, over a longer stretch. But um, that, that's kind of a long-winded answer to, um, you know, a long-winded explanation of what he's talking about there when it comes to quant. Right, right. In term, and, and so in that sense, you know, so getting back to how the Yale endowment structured is that I can see why it's, I mean, it's very difficult to, to allocate to a, tr a trader. Yeah. Um, but but you know so what what they do is uh, you know getting back to the point where it's very difficult to uh, generate alpha in in the bond portfolio through bond investing. So he does that in house. There's no point outsourcing that. Mm -hmm. uh, U.S. equities, uh, you know, U.S. big cap equities, they can just hold in house. They don't need to outsource that. He says the the three biggest sources of alpha, which which is uh, buyouts, uh, hedge funds. And in hedge funds, he, he means by long short. Um, and the third one, which I thought, which was really interesting to me, and I didn't really, and I still don't really understand it, is the, the, the oh, and, and, and sorry, buyouts and, and the highest, the highest alpha is in venture cap. But right under venture cap, and so, so it gets hedge funds, hedge funds is the lowest of the four that outsourcing, then there's, uh, what what I say? Uh, hedge funds, buyouts. The highest is venture capital. So in between, mm -hmm. which I, this is the one I don't appreciate. I don't I don't see how there's so much alpha is real estate funds. So those those. It's the leverage, I bet. But that can. But a lot. You yeah, know. No, I, that totally makes sense to me. That totally makes sense. There's that much alpha to do on real estate. Real estate is this. It's this opaque private market, where you can get an information edge, and you can get a. Um, a management edge, uh, but I mean, yeah. like, so we we live here in Miami, and and oh, and their real estate is is primarily commercial. But sure, apparently, yeah, multi 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 family residential I, counts I, I as could commercial. I could totally see that if you know my wife okay. is a, a real estate agent who deals in commercial, and there is a huge range of um, uh, cap rates available, of risk levels. Um, there are all these, these unique factors to every deal. I mean, some guys will give you phony numbers. <laughs> some guys are going to tie you up in court and you're going to have legal costs. Um, there may be hidden problems in the property. Um, there may be another development in the works adjacent which is going to impact you right. know, your return. They're all, they're like every, every property is unique. And so you, you really can get an information edge there. And when it comes to, to managing a property or developing a property, again, it's like um, there's real value in, in expertise and competence. And it's, you, can't, you can't just throw it all in a spreadsheet. So I, I definitely, I, I can easily see how huh. there is alpha in, in, a real, in re managing a real estate portfolio. Okay, so so, well, I'm glad you know you, you explained that to me a little bit. I think it's and it's, it's I guess the same factors as private equity, right? You know, it's you can't you can't just these are these are uh, you know businesses. A, a commercial real estate is a, it's a kind of business, but um, mm -hmm. private private equity is a is a business. You're you're dealing in the world of businesses that are not reporting to the SEC every quarter. Right. So these numbers are not getting fed into data streams that, you know, quant programs can sift through and all come up with the same result. Well, private equity and growth equity, I completely understand that because um, aside from getting the deal, um, I think there's a lot of alpha to be made in, in stewarding and managing company. Yeah. You know, Peter Drucker used to say, nobody knows less about your business than your CFO. 
the concept being that you know the numbers are all about the past, but the future is all about the direction, the strategy, and the management. And if you're a good manager, um, uh, I, I can see, I can see, you know, I can see you, I can see that delivering. That's a ability to that's that allows the manager to deliver a lot of alpha. If you can, if you can, from Swenson's perspective, identify a good manager, um, a, you know, business manager. This is, or or from a um, I just at a private individual level, if you acquire a business and, and you're a good manager, you can s s you know scale it up. Mm -hmm. um, so that's how the Yale, so Yale at this primary, you know, and, and I think it's partly a market decision, but partly what's available set of opportunities. But a lot of the money's outsourced um, in this areas, and it sounds you know from a con from a conventional s s mindset, it it sounds risky, especially in the in light of of the of this zeitgeist of the times. Where nobody really generates alpha, and they're not worth what they're not worth their fees, and whereas Yale's got the lion's share of its money outsourced to uh, to outside money managers. Yeah, if and it's that's um, it's a good source of a non-correlation. Sure, private equity and public equity—they're both equity. They're they should be all correlated, but. Um, you know, each manager is going to have a different, a different strategy. Some will be doing, you know, they'll be doing different kinds of businesses, um, or they'll have, um, I don't know, different different approaches. So, um, it's a it's a source of diversification. They're, the way they get their alpha is going to vary manager by manager. In a way that I don't think you can find. Um, in the public markets, because e everything in the public markets is commoditized now. I mean, um, so much of what used to be alpha is now just smart beta, <laughs> and it's now really cheap. It's easy, and because it's easy, it's cheap. Um, and so you can't even call it manager talent anymore because even the academics know about it and have defined it. So you know, this gets into an interesting point that I thought. Uh, we discuss is um, Swenson also gets into this um, differentiation between the public markets and the private markets, and and he said, you know, if if you if the uh, private or the private equity guys didn't charge the twenty percent management fee or performance fee, uh, he would have almost you'd want to have all your money in the private markets because of in his mind the public markets he sees as dysfunctional. Um, and partly that the reason it's dysfunctional is because of the short short termism. Yeah. So I wanted to you know talk to you about that, like what your thoughts on that were, was. It's it's perverse. I mean this this shortening of the uh, time horizon. Everybody's time preference is so high now that you have on the on the manager side, people are evaluated by their quarterly numbers or their annual numbers. Your annual number is like a longer term number. That's ridiculous. I mean, you can, you can tell that's ridiculous because when you look at something like a quant value strategy, which has you know, been distilled into smart beta, um, that can underperform for years at a time. So it doesn't mean the factor's gone away when it underperforms. So why, why sh and there's so much randomness in this in, in um, near-term performance anyway. It's just, it's, um, well, I think so it's, not, it's not even valid statistically to look at short-term performance to begin with. Well, I think Swenson's perspective was how it influences the, the, ma the business yes, management. That's, that's, so there are two sides. You have, you have the, uh, you have the um, investment managers uh, being evaluated on short-term performance. And then, yeah, you have the your um, you know, business management trying to make the numbers. You know, make you know they have the, there's this whole game that's played with analysts uh, guiding revenue and profit numbers every quarter, every year. Um, and, the, and the CFO massaging, <laughs> the massaging the the. Uh, the income statement. I mean, this is all just a waste of energy. So I, I have a few counterpoints. I'll make the first counterpoint first, uh, or the better counterpoint first. Um, so that's certainly the the you know the the criticism of of 
businesses that are catering to Wall Street, the, yeah. right? There's a short-termism focus. There's the idea that management are, are granting themselves stock options and then, and then doing things to um, help the short-term stock prices and maybe sacrificing the long-term business. Uh, the counterpoint is, my, counter, my better counterpoint is, is the market really doing that universally? Amazon has a tremendous leash. Right, Com there's companies out there that the markets have given a tremendous leash and don't focus on the, uh, aren't focusing on the short term numbers. So, how much short term is ism is there really out there? And from the business manager's point of view, if you want to focus, if you truly want to focus on the long term health of the business, then maybe your job is to be, partly your job is to be a good communicator communicate to the market that this is what your strategy and your vision is so you get the shareholder base that you want true that's a good point i don't really know i, I don't look at individual companies <laughs> <laughs> right it's tremendously pleasurable to just look at it from an academic point of view <laughs> yeah i mean yeah, it's been over it's been a decade now since i've really looked at um you know seriously um, traded individual companies based on anything, um, you know, anything fundamental. That's, it's so my counterpoint is that is at a more at a philosophical level, and they may be more applicable. Is there is there something good about short term short termism in the sense that you're holding the feet to the fire, meaning you're creating some sense of urgency? Because time does drag on too, and you could be going eight years down something, you'd be like, yeah, you know, it's, it's any year now. Sure, yeah, yeah but that's a, that's a great point you made, that um, maybe that managers and investors find each other's type. You know, guys with a long, a long time horizon with a, a great deal of patience and trust um, found Warren Buffett and stuck with him. I mean, nobody really trades Berkshire Hathaway. Um, and, and the same same thing with a growth company like Amazon, right? If you believed in what Bezos was doing, um, yeah, you gave him. They gave him that leash. There's no question. Right. They gave him that leash. Or heck, I mean, Tesla, Elon Musk, and right. He's got the leash. He's got the leash. Stocks. Uh, I don't understand why that company is not selling more stock. Do you? <laughs> you, you it might their, not be able to. I don't look at a lot of a, a lot of companies anymore, but I, I looked at their. They absolutely can. Their their stocks. I don't know if it's doubled in the last year or something. It's um, it's valued at something like six hundred thousand dollars per car produced compared to six thousand dollars for a Ford or GM. What what made it, what motivated you to look closer into the financials of that company? Um, you just hear about it everywhere, and you know, I heard somebody say that it was, you know, something. Of, I, I heard about the the valuation, mark it was, you know, market cap per car sold, and um, it's just, and it's a fascinating company. You know, they came out with their, their they announced that semi truck and new sports car a couple weeks back. Um, I just. That I, I always follow. I follow what Musk is doing too, because he, uh, he is pushing forth, you know, giving birth to all this, um, all this technology. Um, so in terms it's, almost, of it's almost like an early twentieth century. Um, he is almost <laughs> like an early twentieth century uh, industrialist. Uh, the way he's bringing forth you know, new, new things, the big new things. So, so yeah, I, did, I don't know why he's not selling more stock. So you know, I don't have any insight into his thinking, he's but, but burning cash but like crazy. There's, you know, there's three reasons why um, people do, you know don't issue stock. One is they they believe their stock is worth more than it is, and and they think they can uh, get a better price. I don't know if he's in that camp or not. The other reason, and this is this is. Um, this is to your, you know, your point, like why he, you know, why he should be raising it right now. But there's a saying, um, which is, you should raise the cash when you can, not when you have to. That's right. And he might be thinking, oh, I have enough cash. You know, I don't know who am I to they say. They don't that. have much cash. They don't have much cash. So they must be think it must be going to market soon. I mean, you would think so. I, I certainly would. I mean, he got into big trouble in in 08. You know, that was he'd um, 
he put everything into SpaceX and they had enough cash for four launches. His first three launches blew up and that was it. Um, Tesla was, you know, was in its infancy back then. But um, so yeah, I mean, he must, it must be on his mind. But uh, anyway, that's neither here nor there for <laughs> what we do. So um, getting, uh, getting back to Swenson, um, I think we actually covered a lot of territory. Um, is there anything that you want to particularly uh, discuss that uh, you, we haven't? Uh, not in particular. I, I noticed that in this interview with, um, at the CFR recently, he, he used the word capitalism a lot. Yes. Did you pick up on that? Yes. So that, that you know, I did. And I thought that was really interesting. Um, one, and this got into the perspective of, you know, what, what, what I want to talk about him as a personality from, you know, kind of what I saw when he was a professor yeah. and also the way he interacts with, with Yale is that he, um, he seems to like walk, walk this line in this world where he's very, I, I mean, I don't, he's like almost like a gentleman, like, and, and get to the idea of, you know, get this fed into the idea of we're saying how, where does all this bloat, all this bloat at Yale and where does the money go? Um, so this, it, it, you know, he, he's, a, he's a steward of capital for the Yale Endowment. And he deals with Yale that's full of bloat and feel of bureaucracy, but he does it in, it seems like such a healthy way, <laughs> such a healthy way, like almost as if like, he manages the politics of it all, or the bureaucracy of it all really well. And Yale's this, Yale's again, and the world is this sense where capitalism seems to be is under, under threat. And he, in his mind, clearly understands that capitalism is, in his mind, the best model. And it's certainly the best model to get a return, return on equity. And, and, and he's looking for that. You know, he, one of the things he doesn't, he says there's some places we just don't invest in. We just don't invest in Russia because you don't know what you own. He said he invests in fewer emerging markets now than 20 years ago. Right, which is, which is fa you know, fascinating. Um, because he sees capitalism being under threat in the in the in the world as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, that being you know that being said, in his mind, it's very clear. It's very clear what's worthy of investment, what he wants to invest in. At the same time, he's he's deals in a world where capitalism is under threat, and in a, and in an institution that doesn't ubiquitously embrace capitalism. And 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 a, and, a, and a side part of that is uh, has blow. And exactly. So I wonder, how, you know, I just wonder how that's not frustrating to him. It doesn't seem like it gets to him. Yeah, yeah. I, I certainly would be would be frustrated. <laughs> <laughs> so he joked about that, right? Is that one of the things he's doing w with the university? Is that if he said for the last twelve to eighteen months mm -hmm. he's going to the university and telling them that they should expect less for a contribution from yeah well that's 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 just uh because he sees the uh universe of investment possibilities being you know uh, overvalued um right, so but he's the, expecting lower returns than he has had historically right but my point is that he's doing it for 12 to 18 months and he's not and he's not like i mean you know he's got this Understanding of bureaucracy and that that it requires this re repetitive process that doesn't that he doesn't find frustrating. So right. you know one of the, this right. You know you think like if you're Yale's provost and David Swenson comes to you, I mean he's like he's one of the greats. If anybody knows what he's talking about, <laughs> it's David Swenson. The guy comes to you and says, you know, when planning out your budget for the next ten years you might want to reduce the expectation of return from the in the in the endowment why don't you cut it back a little bit and uh you know plan on tightening your belt or not at, le at least not growing um, your expenses so fast and you think that would that that would cause uh, everybody to you know take a hard look at where the money's going and what they could what they could cut back on uh, that's, I guess, that's just the way institutions are. They're, they're big ships, and they're hard to turn or hard to slow down. So I came across this um, 
a few years back, and I thought this was fascinating, was um, the president of Harvard, uh, and I forgot her name, but she said the biggest, sh I guess, shock that she had when she became, now, when you become a president of a university, you, you, you come out of academics. And she says as an academic, you know, every day you face a blank page, you, you uh, decide what you want to study or what you're going to con contribute in an academic way to the world, mm -hmm. and you say it and then it's done. Mm -hmm. And she said the biggest change that she saw when she became president of the university is how much you have to repeat yourself. Right. She said, you know, as an academic, you don't repeat yourself. You do your study, <laughs> you, you present it to the world, and that, that, that's that. Oh, it's a political position. And, and yeah, I mean, that's, and I, I think, you know, to what she said and what Swenson realizes, I guess, is that they, they handled the, I guess, I'm just, I'm amazed that, you know, somebody that, uh, I guess, deals in the world of, of finance and more numbers and, and metrics handles the politics of it all so well. He's obviously multi, multi-dimensional. Yeah. Yeah. Especially, you know, being so concerned with capitalism at an institution where, um, you know, the vast, I mean, whole departments are basically Marxist. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> there's not a lot of, uh, there's not a lot of respect for, um, for the free market. So that's not lost on him. I mean, he, you know, but he, no. yet he loves the university. Yeah, he does. He does. But I mean, it's an old institution and uh, it's, it's not going anywhere. And maybe this, you know, this phase will pass. And it's not, that's not his job. His job is to manage the endowment um, and make sure that, you know, the institution is as strong as it can be um, no matter what. Um, it's he's a fascinating character. It's it's um, he's got he's got an enviable job really in, in many ways, and but an unenviable one in, in others. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so yeah, that's uh, there wasn't anything else that I wanted to to comment on. Um, I guess you know one of the things you know I'd like to close out. Um, is at least discussing um, the, per the application of Swenson's Yale model in a, in a personal way. Oh, yeah. Because that's, that's achievable and useful for a lot of people. Yeah. Um, well, you can't, an individual is going to have to stick to um, the liquid markets, but there are a lot of possibilities. Um, you've got a lot of options now with ETFs and, and um, um, index funds. So yeah, I would, I would say it's just the Yale model is is heavy if you count private equity and venture capital. Um, it's heavy on equities. Um, so you'd have to put together a like a globally diversified um, equity heavy asset allocation portfolio. So you do you know, a certain amount in U.S. equities. Europe, Japan, emerging markets, um, maybe a little bit in value, a little bit in momentum, maybe, even though we don't know if he does that, but the hedge funds that he invests in, probably many of them use momentum. Um, you do real estate in the US and abroad. And I know Yale was among the first um, institutions to invest in land itself, land like farmland or forest land. Yeah, they got a lot of timber land. Yeah, yeah. Um, there are timber timber REITs now. Yeah, I wonder how good they, uh, how well they're correlated to the actual asset. It's, so timber is a fascinating asset class. Yeah. Um, do you know much about timber as an asset class? Not too much. I know a lot about forestry. <laughs> That's right. You were at the School of Forestry. Are you, so, I mean, what, I mean the print, from an investment perspective, what's really nice about timber is that it keeps growing, right? The, yeah. t the tree keeps growing if, the, if, the, if it's, it's a... It's very predictable. Yeah, it's very predictable. If, it's, if it happens to just be a bad, uh, I guess, time to sell, you can just let the tree grow. That's and, right. And, and, That's right. And cut it another. There was that, I think it was the king of Prussia that used to like only invest in like two things. It was like Timberland and, you know, something else, but. That's right. Um, 
Yeah, he, uh, he would make money through various speculations and businesses, but then to keep it, he would put it into Timberland. So I remember, you know, the, going back to the class, I remember when Swenson was talking about the kinds of things Yale invested in back in, you know, so I was taking his class in 94, 94, 95. And again, I had such a limited scope of the world and he's talking about, you know, I first thought it was, I remember, I remember around 93 reading that Warren Buffett's net worth went from like 3 billion to 6 billion or something. And, and I just thought it was, I was like, oh my God, this guy has all his money in the stock market. Like that's nuts. Like I couldn't imagine like how anybody could like, isn't that risky? Then, you know, I go to go take Swenson's class and he's talking about they, they invested in Snapple at, you know, when it was still a private company and they had their money in Timberland. And it just seemed like so esoteric, the things you're investing in. I was like, how can like, how can these large endowments that are, you know, and have to be prudent investors invest in these esoteric assets? And I didn't have a full appreciation for that. It just seems gamey on the surface, but having a well-diversified, thought out portfolio that's uncorrelated holistically, and holistically is a very robust, very strong portfolio. Oh yeah. I mean, 100% of Timberland and 100% of timber of Brazilian Timberland may not be a great idea, but having some fraction of it is a you know is a terrific idea. Yeah, a lot of that land is in New England. I've I've been to some of that land. <laughs> Very nice forest. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's it's it sounds strange, it's unusual, but if you think about what it really is, it's a very safe investment. But and, and that's. I guess that's what that's what Swenson did. Swenson had a lot of confidence in his ability to get down to first principles and look at what um, what he was actually investing in, and so and to trust his judgment. And because of that, he was among the first to go into these more um, esoteric asset classes. But when you get down to it, it's it's um, you know it's safe. Safe, um, not terribly risky stuff, he, other than venture capital. Um, so, so to you know, get back to where I digressed you from. Um, so, you know, the average investor can't do Timberland and venture cap and private yeah. equity, but they can certainly do a globally diversified portfolio that has an equity leaning, and the equity leaning is because over time, it, it outperforms most other asset classes. Yeah. You pay the, you pay for a little volatility, but you can temper that by being diversified and diversifying yeah, into other this, assets. This is so easy to do today. You, I mean, a, a simple version would just be, say, forty percent in the S and P, and and um, you know, thirty percent in um, in international equities, or pick your mix, and. As, 15% in, uh, in real estate and 15% in commodities, something like that. That's going to be more stable than just the S&P, but it'll have a, a long-term return that's comparable. And that's where the diversification is the only free lunch on Wall Street comes yeah. from. It's so easy to do. I mean, you can, you can pick your mix, be more conservative um, by owning a lower fraction of equities and a higher fraction of bonds. That one, I didn't even include bonds in that, but um, hey, you just pick your mix and rebalance once a year, once every two years, it's fine. And anybody can do it now. You don't have to pay very much for it. You can do all this with uh, very low cost, highly liquid um, index funds, index ETFs. Um, yeah, it's it's a good time to be an individual investor. Except for valuations. Except for valuations. <laughs> but other than, but the, the tools are all, you know, the all there. The tools are all there. They are ready to be used. And, uh, you know, so, I mean, Swenson, Swenson is one of the great, is, you know, he should be like our patron saint, paint, the patron saint of our show because he's one of the people that comes out of academia that has beaten the market and That's shows right. it's possible. So, I don't really have you know much else. I do think you know he's got a couple books out there. I don't remember the names, but I think portfolio management or something, and it might be worth for someone who wants to look a little bit closer at what Swenson's uh, specific advice is um, to to read that book. When I'm older, what I can appreciate about it is that book actually has a lot of merit. When I, if I read that when I was I, when oh, I was yeah. younger, I would have just been like, 
I don't want, you know, 13 half percent. Like, eh. <laughs> 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 but as you get older, you realize truly how, how uh, good those numbers are, especially on size. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So, anything else, Ricker? No, I think that's a wrap. Thank you for watching. See you next time.